So you heard two pieces taken out of context, which is something I usually don't like to do at all. But for this purpose, I think the composers would have agreed that it is a good idea, because if we talk about something, we need to know what we talk about. And um, I picked these two compositions, the two composers, um, to show how on, uh, with, complete, with a complete different set of tools, um, the same impact within the listener can be reached. So I um, assume that most musicologists would agree that Bach's composition is more complex, more sophisticated in the counterpoint than Vivaldi's composition. Vivaldi's Dabat Mart has a pretty simple composition harmonically, yet both compositions achieve to me when I sing, and I think also to the audience, they can achieve a, a deep spiritual experience or a moving experience. So we cannot say that the more complex a composition is, the better it is. Some people are moved by compositions by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And, and I don't want to, want to joke about it. Just recently we heard a concert of a friend and this girl just started singing, promise me and the lady next to me burst into tears. So, and I, for a fraction of a second, I thought, is this silly, why is she? But no, I, I, after a millisecond, I realized, no, how can I judge what is moving, what is honest, what is truthful? And um, so Bach and Vivaldi here. Of course, I, I thought a lot, what is, uh, how can we describe truth in, in music? And what I just realized, to, to just, Go back in time now, uh, about 45 minutes when we rehearsed this piece here. I was just upstairs having a coffee, still discussing with Rob, while the orchestra already started playing the first movement of this Cantata 170. And I just didn't rush, but I walked down quickly and I stood in place and had to sing the piece out of nowhere. And, um, out of context, as I said before, and the difficulty, of course, is to get into the mood. But then I realized that if we want to achieve something that is truthful, that is honest, it doesn't come through me alone. It's the collective effort that creates a moment of truth in concert. So to succeed in conveying the message of the composer, it's not the composition alone, of course, most important, it's the composer, but it's the musicians and it's every individual musician that really needs to feel the deep desire to give everything. And when I stood there in the rehearsal, I just turned around and I saw all these musicians, everybody was so much into it and it made me so happy. And I thought this is where, this, where the great moments on, on stage come from. It's the collective effort. A concert will only be perceived by the audience as a fulfilling experience if really everybody in the, within the group wants to achieve this. And I've, unfortunately, of course, I've also played in orchestras where there's 70% motivated players and 30% players who do their duty, which they call in Germany, ich gehe zum Dienst. And they, yeah, that's orchestra musicians who grab their violin as somebody grabs his folder to go to the office. And of course, that doesn't work. It's, it's the collective effort and a chain of um, uh, events that need to happen in order to communicate the message of the composer. And uh, what do we need to identify, I asked myself also. What, what if I would sit in an audience, how can I identify something that is, is um, honest, a performance that is honest? Um, there are two elements, I think. First, there's the composition, and the composition has a desire to be communicated. It comes from the uh, creative spirit of the composer who thought about writing a cantata for a specific Sunday, or a piece um, based on a poet uh, that expresses the grief of the mother, mother Jesus underneath the cross, um, suffering, seeing her dead son. 
So these are the, the basic ideas that the composer has to communicate. And then the composer finds tools to express this in the composition. But the tools, for me, need to fit in a, in a structure that exists. Otherwise, I can't identify it. I can say a wall is green because I have seen green walls and we all agree that green is a certain color that we can identify. So the, 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 the rules have been created, and that's the nice thing about being a baroque musician or an early musician, being in early music. These rules have been um, defined by people as probably as we think about what is truth and beauty in music uh, in the uh, Renaissance time. People met, for example, in Florence and they thought, what is more important in music, the music or the words? And they, they had long debates and composers that dared to com compose in a new style um, were attacked, like Claudio Monteverdi when he composed his first operas. It was too wild. Before the composition was merely an expression of I would say the creator spirit of the composer that communicated with the universe or God, however he wanted to see it. But the audience, the listener, was not part of that equation. And then this group uh, around, uh, assembled around the father also of Galileo Galilei, Vincenzo Galilei, they tried to define new, uh, new borders for what is important in music. And... Um, they thought that the listener was an important part in the equation, the person that listens to the music, and that music has a power to transform human beings, and that access comes through two levels. Um, and they defined it in, in Latin, they said, movere e docere, to, to move and to teach. And um, these are the, the important elements. I think, um, coming briefly back to Andrew Lloyd Webber, I personally think that there's nothing bad about this music, but it probably relies too much on the emotional side of music. So it's a skillful use of certain chord progressions, knowing what they can trigger in a listener. And Bach, for example, combines for me ideally both sides, the complexity of his composition and the um, emotional side. If we just imagine the first few bars of Abamadich, for example, this aria, it, it's, it's a complex composition, but it still triggers, to me, it tr stimulates my soul instantly, not just through the intellect that I analyze the piece, and through the an analysis I gather some knowledge that then moves me, but it moves me directly. So this is probably the most direct way to communicate with somebody, is to talk to somebody, and as the body language uh, and the voice have um, ways of achieving something, like you, you increase the volume to speak louder, you can sing louder. And there are certain formulas that you can use out of this um, agreed toolbox that was defined at that time. And what, we, what I extract as truth is only possible, or I can only extract truth in a composition if I look at it or get an idea. I don't want to say I don't want to judge a composition, but I sense something in the composition because I can identify these elements, the tools, the code that has been agreed upon. And um, fortunately, within all my repertoire, the uh, these, these rules apply. So Renaissance music, Baroque music is always based on the simple idea of I prepare a piece, how would I speak it? And if my, my singing teacher says, if you know how to speak it, you have a pretty good idea how you would sing it. So I use the tools of rhetoric, of dramatization, uh, the, the narrators, the orators' tools. There's, uh, if we talk about historic music practice, that's what we have in, in, in the early music scene. We think a lot about how was it done? Where's the source? Is there one true moment? How Bach performed this piece? And unfortunately then some people think if we know this, we recreate this moment and then we will have truth in this moment. 
but I think that's, well, it's like uh, opening an old bottle of wine maybe, but it, it cannot be truthful because the musicians that play these instruments these days live in the 21st century, not in the, not in the 18th century. Um, in your opinion, is it possible that music is truthful and not beautiful? And is it possible that music is beautiful without being truthful? Yeah, absolutely. That's it's important. Beauty uh, expresses itself in, in two ways to me. Beauty to me is a successful communication, for example, of a cantata. That's a beautiful thing. But the main focus for me should never be to sing beautifully primarily. That's not, it's, it's to be truthful. And if, if Bach in the recit after the first aria says, Die Welt, das Sündenhaus bricht nur in Höllenlieder aus. It, it's, it's very, it's preaching with music and it's drastic words and it's basically accusing the whole community in church and saying, you are all evil, you are all bad. And, and well, that, that cannot be sung beautifully. If I, if I try to create beautiful sounds, I will miss, miss the point. And that's a little bit the danger of the countertenor voice, I think. I, 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 well, it's, 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 it's um, uh, being in love with your voice. Yeah, that's, uh, for, for, young, for young singers, that can, for young singers that, that, can, that can be a problem. And you need a good teacher who... I remember, of course, that you have dramatic handle areas and, and you, you create beautiful sounds, but it's not really meaningful. And then you need a teacher who says, yeah, it sounds beautiful, but it's not what, it, what it's meant to be. So there's this kind of beauty. And my singing teacher, for example, also says, the art is to make it not sound like an art. And the, that reminds me again of what I said before about the affect. Um, students who work on a dramatic piece think about how, what is a gesture if somebody is disappointed and then they come up with something and I, and I say, well, what do we identify? Do we identify art on stage or do we identify life on stage? If, if art mirrors life and I make a gesture like this, well, we've seen people who are upset and who are aggressive and we've seen people who are surprised and they don't know what to answer or something. So, so I don't have to think in art terms when I do interpretation or when I think about the acting aspect, but I need to think in terms of life because instantly we will, if we see somebody behaving in a certain way on stage, in a certain way that we have seen in real life, we can identify the idea. But if I create operatic gestures, or I sing a Schubert song as everybody expects it, <laughs> then, 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 then I, 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 no, I turn into a ritualized art, artistic way of singing. And then I fulfill the cliché, and there's also the cliché of the endless high sea of an opera aria. <laughs> And, and, and these, these cl the cliches, and we all know it. And there's a whole industry that lives of the cliches. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, I don't want to name any famous Dutch violinists that work with this thing. But, <clears throat> and, even, and even then I would, I would not talk badly about this because still it brings joy to people. I'm used to have, hey, here's a stage. First of all, I'm higher than you are. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> here's a gap. There's a distance. And this is how we present music. And that already suggests something. And I think it suggests the wrong idea. This is, this is an idea of presenting classical music that was invented long after the music was composed that I sung. So in a way, there's something wrong in this picture, being elevated above the audience because it's a collective thing. When I sing, I need the audience as much as the audience wants to listen to me. Yeah, so, so I think uh, an, a good um, impulse could be to bring classical music into different places. I have no illusion about the fact that these people who come to the Yellow Lounge will buy instantly a ticket to hear me in the concert house two weeks later or something. Why? Because they're afraid that 
this is not their kind of classical event. There's the establishment, protected by music critics, who, if they don't watch out, saw on the branch that they sit on, because if, if I crush any attempt to vitalize cl the classic music scene, if I crush any attempt in a newspaper saying, oh, this crappy yellow lounge, what is this terrible, huh? then one day no, the feuilleton will close, the cultural pages, and then even classic music critics participated in their own uh, sinking. Yeah? And I, I, so I think we need a collective effort of the musicians, the promoters, and the music press to try new things and not be afraid and maybe create a parallel music scene.